Hello everyone. Uh, we are Team Harbor Mania, consisting of Raynet, Justin, and Celeste. And this is our robot, which we call Mike. Because it kind of looks like Mike. Um, so a brief introduction of the team. Uh, I'm Raynet, the team leader, and I also handle the programming and debugging along with Celeste. And on the hardware side, we have Justin. So he handles 3D modeling and the 3D printing and assembly of the robot. So a brief overview of the presentation. Um, we've, did, we've just done the team introduction, so we're going to go on with the general robot design considerations, which may consist of PCB, um, serial communications, and as well as the ramps and the bumps. We'll then move on to the line part of the mission, as well as the evacuation zone of the mission. We'll then conclude with reflections, as well as a QR code for the 3D model for Mike. So last year, our wires were very, very messy. Uh, motor wires and sensor wires all come together, and if one snaps, you have to unpack almost everything. So this year, we use PCB as it is more secure, it is more organized, and relatively easy to solder. We also put a hole for additional wires to go through, and it's easy to dismantle as well. So this is the schematics for the PCB. We have two lifelines, 5 volt line which connects to the sensor, and 6 volt lines which connects to the servos and the motors. So for our ramps and pumps, last year uh, our robot cannot pass through the challenge, so this year we double all four motor stock, so it can even climb up to 40 degrees ramp. We also use Omni wheels as our back wheel to ensure that the center of rotation is located between the two front wheels. We also put center of gravity as low as possible with battery below the pod to increase the stability. Since our motor brackets are 3D printed, it's easy to change. We can adjust their height so the pod doesn't get stuck at the pumps. To process images from the camera, we need the Raspberry Pi for its performance. However, the high processing overhead due to running an entire OS would make, make movements laggy. Therefore, we use an Arduino Mega to interface with the motors. How it works is that it joins bytes together. It first begins with the starting character by defining the type of data being sent over, for example, S for speed, then it sends the actual data required, and finally it ends it with a new line character to signal the end of the send data. This is then sent to the Arduino. Now, for line tracking, this year we use a camera for line tracking instead of color sensors. This allows the robot to see a larger area, giving it future information far beyond where the current point of the robot is, and it allows it to know where it's supposed to go so that it can reliably predict its next move. This is useful for gaps after sharp turns, as can be seen by the robot during the prelims route. It also helps with the smoothness of the line tracking. For the camera positioning, we angle the camera downwards as this configuration maximizes the amount of line that can be captured, which provides useful information for line tracking. This configuration also theoretically allows us to capture objects to infinity, which would be useful for the evacuation zone, um, this is as the top ray of the camera is parallel to the ground. Um, now onto PID control. Traditional PID control has both integral and derivative terms. The former corrects for steady state error in the system, and the latter dampens oscillations in the robot. However, we found that these two errors were not noticeable and opted for purely proportional control, where the rotation of the robot is purely scaled by the error value which we will discuss how to obtain later. On the performance side of line tracking, increased loop times reduce the responsiveness of the robot, which would result in greater oscillations. We had to take into account the time taken to process the image, so we decrease the resolution to increase the performance, since the robot does not need much detail to calculate the correction value. Um, so this is the image processing of what the camera sees, on the first line, we grayscale the image. Then, we threshold the image for black, which returns all the black pixels. And then we remove any green squares from the picture. To calculate the error value, we simply uh, calculate the centroid of the image and how far it is from the center of the image. Now, on to green squares. Um, so this is the start and it's the original frame of what the camera sees. So we first apply a crop, um, cropping out the horizon, so the mat only sees the 
the robot only sees the mat in front of it and doesn't allow any noise from the horizon to affect the green square detection. Um, so for green squares, we need to detect the intersection first. So after applying a grayscale, we use the canny edge detection to process the crop frame and to find all the images, the edges within the image. So next, we apply a hoofline transform on the edges of the image. This returns all the lines found on the image in polar form. We can then tune the performance of the function by adjusting the angle interval uh, in which the function performs the check. Um, this is the third variable in the third par parameter in the function. And the sensitivity to the lines can also be tuned by the voting parameter, um, which is the fourth parameter in the function call. Um, the hoofline transform returns the polar representation of all the lines found within the image. We then filter this list of lines, only allowing lines with a theta value in some region of pi over 2, since a 90 degree theta value corresponds to a horizontal line. This region was then tuned to ensure that junctions were detected even with the oscillations of the robot. If there are lines matching this criteria, then we know that we are at an intersection. Now, we must cut everything above the intersection so it only considers green squares below the intersection. Um, we obtain the intersection of the horizontal lines with the sides of the frame using the formula, and then we choose the lowest line in the frame and mask out everything above, which looks something like this. Okay, now let's just consider a case with one green square. We find the number of contours of the green below the junction and consider it centroid. If it lies on the left of the frame, it's a left green square, and similarly for the right. However, we found that if the robot was out of alignment, it is possible that the centroid of a left green square could lie on the right of the frame. Thus, we consider where the green square is with respect to the black line. By checking whether the pixels some distance to the right and left of the image is black, we can conclude the type of the green square. Okay, so on the general logic of the green squares, if there's no contour, we just return back to line checking. Uh, but if there's one contour, it means that there's one green square and we perform a 90 degree turn in the specified direction, which we have found just now. Afterwards, just return back to line checking. If there are two contours, then we know that the junction contains a double green square. We then perform an on-the-spot turn for some specified time, which we found that it was around 1.5 seconds. We can turn by time as any inconsistencies in its final heading will be corrected by the line checking algorithm. So uh, this is the robot doing the green squares. On to obstacle avoidance. Last year, we faced the issue that our TOF was only on one side of the robot and is thus unable to decide which direction to turn to. This may result in a robot colliding against the wall. Now, we have TOFs on both sides of the robot, which allows us to know which direction to turn to. Furthermore, the sensors are now located along the axle track of the robot, which contains the sensor of rotation. This results in smoother obstacle tracking. This year, we used a different method for obstacle avoidance. Instead of proportional control, we use a new and improved algorithm. Here is the robot doing the obstacle avoidance. So, how it works is that when the robot first sends an obstacle using the TOF, it turns to the side until it sees an obstacle. It turns, demonstrated by the red line, until it sees past the obstacle again, then it turns. The process repeats with the blue arrow showing the TOF seeing past the obstacle. It stops when the camera sees the line, which is passed from the Pi to the Arduino, and starts line tracking again. We use 3D printed claws for picking up objects. Uh, they have alternating pincers go on the right, on the left, so that the claws can overlap each other while being closed, and hence can securely grab objects of different sizes. It can also prevent any torque on the objects that can cause them to pop out of a claw. Plus, the gap between the claws allows our camera to see through the claws, so we can detect the balls, differentiate them, uh, even when the claws are down. So this is the robot picking up the balls by detecting its round shape. 
The robot will deposit the objects to its front. This can be done as the compartment servo arms are designed in such a way that turning the servo will push the back part of the compartment up. The pivot is fixed to a mount, hence the compartment can turn forward and deposit the objects. The compartment is also divided into two parts. One is slanted with a tunable angle so that we can deposit that part first by controlling the angle of the servo. This is what the camera sees. After grayscaling the image, we use hoof circles to detect any circles in the image, allowing us to find the balls in the effect zone. Standard deviation found of the balls is used to determine what type of ball it is. So, alive balls that are more reflective have higher standard deviation than dead balls that are non-reflective. And false positives are eliminated by increasing the accumulated th threshold for the circle centers at the detection stage at parameter 2. So for reflection, uh, teamwork is important. We are able to solve problems by communicating with each other and working together as a team. And then wire management. Uh, we use PCP, so goodbye wiring headaches from last year. By changing light sensors into camera, we can increase reliability in line track because the camera alone can see more area including far away areas. Plus, it can differentiate the objects. 3D printing also makes us able to adapt to unexpected problems. So we made a mistake on the metal motor bracket distance in the PCB, but we already ordered the PCB. So to solve the problem, we 3D print the motor bracket. And then we make the bot easier to assemble and disassemble. So changing hardware should be faster and way easier. For example, if the camera mount if the camera mount breaks, we can just unscrew a few screws and slide it out. Since you also don't want to resolder LED, it takes a lot of time to resolder an LED. So that part can be detached from and reattached to the camera mount as well. So for areas for improvement, uh, we want to hook a controllable LED to the Arduino for possible shadow part in the internationals since camera alone cannot see the line properly in the dark. It's already in the design. Actually, we already put one, but it's currently not controllable as of yet. So that's in the to-do list. We also want to improve some of the 3D models, as some are currently prone to breaking when printed with PLA. We also want to include an IMU, which can be used to center the bot in the middle form of the evacuation zone, so that the bot can see everything around it and detect the object with ransack and pick them up. Plus, with IMU, we can turn more reliably as well. So thank you for uh, joining us in this presentation. Uh, make sure to check out this cool QR code, which is the bot model in Sketchfab. Thank you.